Hello, everyone. It's certainly a blessing to be with you today or tonight, uh, depending on where you are in the world. It's a night for me. And um, just really thankful that you want to study the Word of God with us. Been working on this subject for quite some time, and I'm finally glad to present this material. Uh, we're going to talk about instrumental music. Is it authorized under the New Covenant today? It's something that we need to try to understand, and I hope that we will do so tonight. Now, when we discuss this, <clears throat> I want us to understand that this is a, what I would call a, what I call a symptom of the problem. The main problem is re in regards to this. Do you accept Jesus as your king? Do you accept him in obeying his authority? Because that's really what it's going to boil down to when we get to the heart of this. And uh, I hope that you, what you'll see as we study through these, these materials. Now, I want to go through kind of building a foundation because I think it's kind of important because if somebody really doesn't care whether or not the Bible is the word of God or not, then, you know, this issue is not going to really uh, affect them in a, in a big way. So you need to develop some foundational principles. And I'm going to try to go as fast as I can, if that's all right, because I want to get to the heart of the matter, if I might. So is the Bible, is it the Word of God? Does it contain the Word of God? Or does it become the Word of God? Um, you know, there's... In the religious world, there are what's called neo-orthodoxy, liberal scholars. Um, so you have you have those different views. But when we look at the Bible and what it claims for itself, all Scripture is given by inspiration of God's prophet for, for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be thoroughly equipped, furnished unto every good work. Right. Uh, Second Peter one: Holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. So we accept that the Bible is the Word of God, that it does not contain errors. It is the result of verbal plenary inspiration, meaning that verbal meaning the very words, every word that is God-directed, that God superintended, and that it's plenary and that full in each and every part is inspired, and that, yes, the writers did have their own vocabulary that they added, that they used, but the Holy Spirit was superintending over that, uh, over that work to make sure that it was uh, perfect, perfectly accurate in what God communicated. And then we see that verbal inspiration is claimed throughout Scripture. We see it's more than 3,800 times in the Old Testament. Uh, the Spirit of God was upon my tongue as as. David would say in 2 Samuel 23, verse 2, The word of the Lord came to me saying, and or write uh, the, the word, you know. So it's something, something, uh, something of that nature. Two, we know Jesus endorsed verbal inspiration. I mean, we go to Matthew 5, 17, 18. We can go to Matthew 22, 20, 32, and 41. We know that Jesus would say things like, It is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Christ promised his apostles the words that they would be given by the Holy Spirit, Matthew 10, 19, and 20. The writers were conscious of inspiration. 1 Corinthians 14, 37 says that, uh, Paul says, the things that I write unto you, they are the commandments of the Lord. For, uh, so they understood that they were writing down the word of God. The writers considered one another's production to be inspired. I mean, 1 Timothy 5, 18 is very interesting scripture where, uh, it's interesting that uh, uh, Paul quotes from Deuteronomy 25, verse 4. Uh, you shall not muzzle an ox while it treads out the grain, and he, the laborer is worthy of his wages, which is quoted in Luke 10, verse 7, which is very interesting that when 1 Timothy was written, Luke, the gospel had already been written, and it was recognized as Scripture. And also Second Peter 3, 15 and 16 where Peter recognizes Paul's writings as scripture. So the next question we need to ask is this, can the Bible be understood? 
So that's either yes, no, don't know, don't care. Some people might have an indifferent attitude, right? But we look at Ephesians 3, verse 3 and 4, and I'm going to look at those scriptures with you. Ephesians 3, 3 and 4. I want you to see what the Bible says here. So Paul says, How that by revelation he made known to me the mystery as I have briefly written already. By which when you read, you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ. So they were meant to understand this. Ephesians 5, 17. Therefore, do not be unwise, but understand what the will of the Lord is. So it's very important that we understand what the will of God is. Now, moving on to our next thing. So, we, the Bible is indeed meant to be understood. And think about it, friends. If God, the great creator, the communicator of mankind, had a book for which man could not understand, then why would God go through this whole process of inspiring men to write down a record in the first place? You know, it, over 1,500 years, you write down a document, you use 40 different writers over from different cultures, from different countries, from different times, you write all that down just for so that man could not understand it. How absurd that idea is. And then that's interesting is how, you know, I have actually uh, written a book. And I wrote that book on questions about Mormon doctrine so that people could understand uh, Mormon's teaching and ask them questions. And so if man can write books in which they are desired to communicate to other men what they are writing, then why couldn't God, who is greater than man, who is so much greater than man, why can he communicate to mankind? And certainly God can, my friends. God can communicate his truth to us. People do have that capability of understanding the word of God. Um, for example, uh, I'm not going to look at all these texts, but if you go to Josiah, Josiah, you know, he was a young, they find the book of the law, right? It's read to him, and he rents his clothes because he realizes they've not been following the law of God. Don't you think that he understood what was going on? That for many years they had abandoned God and his word? Or think about Ezra and Israel. They gather the people together in Nehemiah chapter 8. And what is Ezra doing? He's reading the word of God to the people so that they may understand it. And what's interesting in that passage is that they do um, follow the, the and observe the Feast of Tabernacles. And then you got Jesus himself who says many times throughout the scriptures, throughout the gospel accounts, have you not read, have you not read, go in, go in, go in, uh, uh, you know, um, go in, see what it means. Oh, now I got to get the scripture here. Sorry. Yeah, let me, let me look at that scripture real quick. I desire mercy and not sacrifice. Um, yeah. Um, Matthew 9, 13. Go, yeah, but go and learn what this means. I desire mercy and not sacrifice, for I did not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. So go and learn what this means. Jesus, he was telling them that they could understand what is being said here. We read about, even uh, Timothy, from a from a babe, from a from his childhood, he has known the holy scriptures, which are able to make him wise unto salvation, which is in Christ Jesus. Second Timothy three verse fifteen, and then there were whole book uh, letters written to the brethren. Why read it to the whole congregation if they're not going to understand it? Uh, that doesn't make any sense. I mean, we got a such texts like First Thessalonians five twenty seven, which says this. I charge you by the Lord that this epistle be read to all the holy brethren. Why? Why, Paul? Why read it if you can't understand it? Well, that don't make any sense. So, people do have the capability of understanding the Word of God. And men can understand many matters alike. I mean, we see this in everyday matters. We see this in cell ads. We see this in making a recipe. Maybe your grandma's recipe, right? Uh, your prescriptions you're give, that you have to take medicine from. 
Simple math, road signs, blueprints for homes and buildings, final scores of games, food ordered at a restaurant. But yet, when it comes to the Word of God, oh, all logic just flies out the window. <laughs> Friends, we can understand the Bible alike. There's no doubt about that. And understanding the Bible is not just only possible, it is expected to be understood. Now, think about, think about this. Do you think that God was up to the task of making Scripture understandable alike by all? Yeah, he was. That's exactly what God's intent was. If we don't see Scripture alike, where does the fault lie? It lies with us. We're, we're the one that causes the problem. And it's because of our own uh, if, we're, if we're honest with ourselves, it's because I want to do what I want to do. I'm selfish, and I want to do it my way. And I don't want to submit to the, what God's will says. I want to do it my way, and there's a way that seems right to a man, the, uh, and, and the ways thereof are the ways of death. So there is that kind of stubborn attitude that we can all have. And if the Bible cannot be understood alike, then sadly there can be no unity, but yet, yet this is what before Jesus was going to the cross. This is what he prayed about. He prayed about unity for disciples. He prayed about unity. Just as the Father in me and I in him, that the world may believe that you sent me. I mean, can it not be shown, friends, that one of the main reasons why the world does not believe is because of the divisiveness and the divisions in what is called Christendom? Can we not see that? And then we see that, you know, people would say, well, the unity that Paul was talking about was commanding. That's only just wishful thinking. You know, when he said, now I plead with you, brethren, by the name of our Jesus Christ, that there be no divisions among you, but you but that you be joined together in the same mind and same judgment. And they'll say per- perfectly joined together in the same mind and same judgment. And you could see that, oh, uh, you no, know, we can't have that unity. Well, then why did Pete, Paul even say, why did he not want these? And, and this, I know this is, you know, in the context referring to one congregation, but still the truth of the matter is there was that Apollos faction and Peter faction and, and Paul faction and Christ faction. And we, and we see as a case, friends, that Paul wanted there to be unity, be of the same mind, be of the same judgment. And he, obviously he would have, he spends four, well, you know, in our modern day letter, uh, modern day uh, Bibles, four chapters talking about this. So, uh, and even comes back to it in chapter 12, where he wants them to be unified as the body of Christ. So, either... God's will or his ability is lacking is what I think some probably would charge God with. Either God could have written a book that could be understood, but he would not. He's not willing to do so. Or God would have written a book that could be understood, but he could not. He's not able to do so. Yet he gave us a book and required us to understand it in order to be saved. Friend, if that, you know, the Bible is reduced to nonsense if we think that God did not expect man to understand it but also we can understand it alike. We can. We can do so. We really can. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do the things which I say? He obviously wants us to understand what he's what he taught and to obey what he said. Or John 8, 31, 32. This 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 statement makes no sense if if we're if we're reduced to where, oh, we, we really can't have true unity. Oh, we really can't know what God's will is. John 8, 31, 32, you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. If you really are my disciples, you will abide in my word. If you abide in my word, you're my disciples indeed, I'm sorry. And you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. So, friends, we can be a part of the one faith that is mentioned in Ephesians 4, verse 5. We can understand what the will of the Lord is. Now, Think about the, also this. If the Bible cannot be understood alike, then was God up to the task of giving us a book that could be understood? Giving us a book that could be understood alike? Giving us the ability to understand it? Giving us the ability to understand it alike? God was up to the task 
of giving us a book that could be understood, that could be understood alike, that gives us the ability to understand it, and gives us the ability to understand it all alike. Do you believe God wants us to understand the Bible? I hope you do. I hope, do you believe that God wants us to understand the Bible alike? I hope you do. Do you believe that God wants us to have the ability to understand the Bible? I hope you do. And do you believe that God wants us to have the ability to understand the Bible alike? I hope you do. Did God create a perfectly understandable book or a deficient book? Did God create a people able to understand or deficient to understand? Friends, God created a perfectly understandable book, and he did create us as men who have free will, who can study and understand what God, uh, what God's will is. So in order to understand the Bible, like there are certain principles one must understand and apply when we're talking about the subject of instrumental music. This is very, very important, that we must distinguish between the law of Moses and the law of Christ, the old covenant and the new covenant. And we know that these are designated as two different covenants. We have the Old Testament, and even Paul says he's a minister of the New Testament. We know that the Old Testament was called the First Covenant, and the New Testament is called the Second Covenant. Even Jesus refers to it as the New Covenant, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. He, uh, the he, writer of Hebrews, I'm about to say Paul, I don't know if it is Paul or not, but the writer of Hebrews, inspired by God, says that it's a new and living way through Jesus Christ. And so... It's designated two covenants, designated through two different mediators, and that God spoke in times past to the fathers through the prophets, as he did in the Old Testament. And the prophets are represented by, so to speak, Moses and Elijah when they appear to G- with Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration. But what did the Father say? This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Hear him. And so the mediator of the Old Covenant was indeed Moses. But in the New Testament, we see that in these last days, God has spoken to us by his Son, and that we're to listen to him. He is the beloved Son. We're to hear what he says, and he is our mediator. There is one God in between, one, between man, and, I'm sorry, there's one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus, 1 Timothy 2, verse 5. There's also the nature of the two covenants, and that the letter kills but the New Testament, the Spirit, the Spirit gives life because nobody could be justified by the old covenant, friends. It was produced a ministry of death, but the New Testament is the ministry of the Spirit. We see that there's the ministry of condemnation versus the ministry of righteousness, and that God does and can justify us through the gospel of Christ. There's also the written and engraved on stones, the Ten Commandments, right? And then we say that it's on tablets of flesh, of the heart, that it is internal as God intended it to be, 2 Corinthians 3.3. 3. It was, the Old Testament was glorious, but the New Testament is much more glorious. We see that the Old Testament was a shadow of good things, but the New Testament, those shadows were pointing to the substance that is Christ. And then further, there's the circumcision, the nature of the two covenants, and that the old covenant had the circumcision of flesh, while the New Testament is the circumcision of, of, of the heart. We see that there's a circumcision with hands in the Old Testament, but there's a circumcision without hands, that God is the one, through his working, through our faith, that when we're buried with Christ in baptism, he cuts off our sins in immersion that we're forgiven by the blood of Jesus Christ that washes away our sins. There's a tabernacle made with hands under the Old Covenant, but under the New Covenant, there's a tabernacle made without hands that God, that Jesus himself created. There's, under the Old Testament, only Levites were priests, but under the New Testament, all Christians are priests. 1 Peter 2, 5-9. through There's a case that in the Old Testament, there was rest in, in Canaan, but we see under the New Testament that that rest was being, pointing to something much greater, and that is our rest in heaven. Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord, that they may rest from their labors, that their works may follow them. And so, friends, we are living under the new covenant today. There's also two diff- very different sacrificial systems. There is that changeable priesthood and that 
there was sadly the high priest would die and be replaced by a new priest. There is, but we have an un, we live under an unchangeable priesthood. Christ ever lives and is never going to die again. He's resurrected from the dead and he sits down at the right hand of God. There's the imperfect priesthood in which there was a sinner. A, the high priest was a sinner, but we have a we serve under a perfect priest, a, a one who never sinned against God. There's the priest of the tribe of Levi. That 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 was the tribe designated. But here, under the New Testament, we're under Christ, who was from the tribe of Judah. We see that under the Old Testament, there was Aaron, the high priest, who is pointing to the greater high priest, which is Jesus. There's the priesthood being changed of need, and of needing to be. Um, and then the law changed because the priesthood, um, when the priesthood changed, the law also had to change. There was under the Old Covenant, the blood of animals that was Used, but we know that they can never sufficiently ultimately take away sins. Pointing to the, it was pointing to the greater, which is the blood of Christ, which was once for all given, so that mankind can be redeemed by, by sin, from sin. And then there's the many offerings that were made, but Christ offered Himself once and once and for all. There's two very different remedies for sin, and that Old Testament made nothing perfect, but under the New Testament makes all things perfect. We see under the Old Testament, there's the purge of the flesh, but not the conscience. But under the New Testament, our conscience is purified. Isn't that wonderful? We see as a case that there was no forgiveness, absolutely. Sins were remembered yearly, but under the New Covenant, sins and iniquities are remembered no more. We see as a case that under that Old Covenant could not take away sins, but we see that Christ, he can save to the uttermost. We can be saved from our sins. And then under the Old Testament, it could never justify man because man could not keep the law fully all the time, and in which case they were under a curse. Well, as a case that we're justified by grace, which we don't deserve, and it's by means of an obedient faith. There's two very different purposes, that the law was given because of sin but could not give life. But we're under the law of the spirit of life that can take away sin, Romans 8, verse 2. We know the Old Testament was to prepare Jews for Jesus Christ. And it's great when that we can study the Old Testament too. And that's there's believe me, uh, when people say, oh, you don't believe in the Old Testament. Oh, yes, I do. It's inspired of God. But we're not bound by its specific details today, friends. Now, are there lots of principles of of grace faith obedience love uh how how um are there things like that that we can learn from certainly that's what paul was referring to in first corinthians 10 and um, many other chapters in the, in the in the bible so it was to fulfill the seed promise and bless all nations friends and then we see that it was a tutor to bring bring jews to christ but we're no longer under the tutor we're no longer bound by the tutor. We are under the master teacher today. We see that there is two very different durations in that it was passing away. In the New Testament, it remains now. It's, it's, it's here with us today. But the Old Testament is gone. In that, sadly, there was a veil that lied upon their hearts, on the Jews' hearts. Um, but that when... People start studying how the old the prop, prophecies and the types and shadows pointing to Jesus. That veil is taken away in Christ. We see that the old covenant has been made obsolete. It was vanished away, and we're under the new covenant. He takes away the first. They may establish the second, which was done at the cross. It was temporary. It was the last only until Jesus. But we see that we're under it continuously even today, and that. The Old Covenant is abolished, blotted out, nailed to the cross, Ephesians 2, 14, 15, Colossians 2, 14 through 17. But we're under that eternal covenant, Hebrews 13, verse 20. So I think that's very, very important when it comes to this issue of instrumental music, as we'll see. But we're not ready for that just yet. Next, we want to show you that the Bible is indeed all authoritative, all sufficient, and once for all delivered. That all authority inherently resides in God, but in the Christian age, 
He has given that authority over to Jesus. Matthew 20, verse 18, all authority has given to me has been given to me in heaven and on earth. All of Jesus' authority resides in his word. John 12, 48 through 50. Let's read that scripture. John 12, 48 through 50. He who rejects me and does not receive my words has that which judges him. The word I have spoken will judge him in the last day. For I have not spoken on my own authority, but the Father who sent me gave me a command, what I should say and what I should speak. And I know that his command is everlasting life. Therefore, whatever I speak, just as the Father has told me, so I speak. So Jesus gave his word to the apostles, right? I've given them your word in which they are going to be guided by the Holy Spirit. Spirit's going to guide them into all truth. He's going to bear witness with them. He's going to, through them, do miracles and signs and wonders. It's through them that they're going to remember all that Christ taught them. So that's found in John 14, John 16, 12, and 13. And these men and other prophets, they wrote down God's inspired word, 2 Peter 1, 20, 21, 2 Timothy 3, 16, 17, 1 Corinthians 14, 37. Thus the very word authority of God in Christ resides inherently in the words of the Bible. I love how 1 Thessalonians 2, 13, I want to read that scripture to you. 1 Thessalonians 2, 13 says, For this reason we also thank God without ceasing, because when you receive the word of God, and which you heard from us, you welcomed it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God, which also effectively works in you who believes. The Bible is all sufficient. It equips us for every good work, unto everything. It makes the man of God complete. It gives us everything that we need. It equips us for every good work. Through the Bible, everything that pertains to life and godliness has been given to us. And in Scripture, we can find the whole counsel of God. And the Bible has been once for all delivered. The faith was once for all delivered to the saints. The system of faith, the body of Christian doctrine. And it was done orally first, but as time came in the first century, it was all written down in the first century. And we must not add to the Word of God. We must not take away from the Word of God. And we see that that principle is not only just for the book of Revelation, but for all the books of the Bible. And so we must not preach or follow any other gospel. The word of the Lord truly endures forever. So if Revelation was completed in the first century, that means all instruction concerning even how to worship God is found in the scriptures and in the new covenant. And since we're under the new covenant, then we have to look there to please the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And we are made complete in Jesus Christ, Colossians 2, verse 10. So whenever somebody comes along and says, hey, I got a new revelation from God, and I'm thinking about popes, or Roman Catholicism, I'm thinking about Mary Baker Eddy, Ellen G. White, I think about Joseph Smith, and many, many others. Friends, test the spirits, see if they are of God, for many false prophets have gone out into the world. We have, now, in that context... They were using the discerning of spirits, the miraculous gift. But you and I, we have God's complete revelation, and we can use the whole truth, and we can discern between truth and error. And then we see as a case that we must make the proper and necessary distinctions between the authorized and the incidental or circumstantial. What I mean by that is this. So if you were to look at Acts 16, 9 through 12, the authorized would be that we're authorized to preach the gospel. Why? Because that's what God has commanded us to do. And 2 Timothy 4, verse 2, Preach the word, be ready in season and out of season. Convince, rebuke, and exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. The incidental there was that they were traveling by ship. Now, could they travel by camel? Certainly they can. Could they travel by, if they had cars back then, could they have traveled by cars? Yes, of course. So you see, that's incidental. Acts 27 through 9, we see the authorized to worship God as he directed in that we're to partake of the Lord's Supper on the first day of the week. But the incidental was they were meeting on the third floor. Do we really have to build three floors up in order to meet? No, friends, that's incidental. We see we got to make necessary and proper distinctions between the circumstances and the conditions. So, for example, circumstances would be that Paul and his group came on the Sabbath day by the riverside, there was a place of prayer going on. Uh, there was the women that were meaning to pray. That's the circumstances. But the conditions that they taught them 
was the teaching of the Word of God. Paul preached the gospel. He taught the gospel. They heard, they believed, and they were baptized. We know, well, of course, we know Lydia was baptized into Christ. So that is the conditions of faith. They obeyed what God said to do. We see the case in Acts 16, 25 through 34. The circumstances in, is that Saul and, uh, sorry, Paul and Silas are in prison. There's an earthquake that occurs. There's open doors, loose chains. I mean, is that supposed to happen today? No, no, friends. The, but the conditions still are binding in that they taught the Philippian jailer, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, you and your household will be saved. And he taught the word of the Lord to them. And we see that he shows repentance. He changes his mind. We see that he immediately was baptized into Christ. So the teaching, hearing, believing, and being baptized is necessary. We see the proper... Now, this is interesting here because we have those like the Pentecostals, we have those like Mormons, and some others who still believe that the miraculous is still going on today. And that we see that the we must recognize the distinctions between the p- temporary and the permanent. And that there were apostles who were immersed in the power of the Holy Spirit. There were apostles who were endowed with the power and ability to impart miraculous gifts to others. There were miraculous gifts possessed by Christians upon whom an apostle laid his hands to whom the letters were written. Now, this is something that my own brethren need to understand, is to make a proper distinction. For example, I'm going to give you one example of this. Uh, But there are many, many, many more that I could appeal to. I want to just read Galatians 3, for example, to give you an example of this. So, O foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you that you should not obey the truth, before whose eyes Jesus Christ was clearly portrayed among you as crucified? This only I want to learn from you. Did you receive the Spirit by the works of the law? Meaning, did you receive miraculous gifts by the laying on hands by these Judaizing teachers? Or did you receive the Holy Spirit by this hearing of faith, by Paul and the apostles who were, had the ability to lay their hands on and give them miraculous gifts? Because notice what he says further. Are you so foolish? Having begun the Spirit, are you now being made perfect by the flesh? Have you suffered so many things in vain, if indeed it was in vain? Therefore, he who supplies the Spirit to you works miracles among you. Does he do it by the works of law or by the hearing of faith? Well, of course, they can know by the argument. I mean, this is an argument from experience. They can know by true experience that they received it from Paul, who is the true source of, who is giving the truth of God's message. And and so <coughs> you and I can really learn from that in that we can see that that does not, part of that does not apply to us today. We do not receive the Holy Spirit in Galatians in this way, in, in a miraculous manner. That's what we need to understand in regards to that passage. Now, and you can look at much more passages, like sealed with the promise of the, uh, of the Spirit in Ephesians 1, 13, and 14. I think that's very important to understand. So there was necessary yet temporary elements in the infant church in that there were, were living apostles, but they also started dying out. We know that James was killed, right, in Acts 12. We see that um, Paul would later on die in the 60s AD. And miracles would cease when the purpose was fulfilled. 1 Corinthians 13, 8 through through 13 makes this clear. And there were spiritual gifts that were given to these Christians during this time. But it was never intended to be part of permanent Christianity. We can also say the same, same in regards to that the early church needed divine guidance. They needed instruction. They did not, did not have yet the complete will of God. They needed prophets placed in the church by God through whom he would directly reveal the message to them because they don't have a written new covenant yet. So the necessary yet temporary elements of the infant church would be prophets, direct revelation, but that was never intended to be part of permanent Christianity. We must understand that 
the difference between the temporary and the permanent. And I wish we could get that across to really such like those of, of Pentecostals, Latter-day Saints, and many others. And then people could see the truth. Now, here's something in regards to our Seventh-day Adventist friends that I want them to understand, that I want them to come to knowledge of the truth on, and that the Ten Commandments, including the Sabbath, was indeed temporary. I mean, if you read not any of my 9, 13 and 14, it says there that God made known to Israel his holy Sabbath. Read it. Read Nehemiah 9, 13 and 14. I think it's very, uh, in fact, let's read it together, if you don't mind. I think that's a very important passage of Scripture. Nehemiah 9, 13 and 14. You came down also on Mount Sinai, spoke with them from heaven, gave them just ordinances and true laws, good statutes and commandments. You made known to them your holy Sabbath and commanded them precepts, statutes, and laws by the hand of Moses, your servant. See, God made known to Israel, the nation of Israel, the Sabbath. They were to remember the Sabbath day, to keep it holy. They were not to do any work on the Sabbath day. They were to also, uh, it was a case that they were to remember they were redeemed from the house of bondage from out of Egypt in Deuteronomy chapter 5. But you see, God promised a new covenant, different from the old covenant. Jeremiah 31, 31 through 34 makes this clear, in which we see as a case in Colossians 2, 14 through 17, having nailed it to the cross, Therefore, let no one judge you in regards to Sabbaths, to festivals, talking about Pentecost, Passover, Feast of Tabernacles, etc., etc. We are under the new covenant. Now, now, a lot of people, a lot of times I, I hear the counter argument to this is, oh, so you're saying that we can go out, commit adultery, go out, murder people, right? No, friends, that's not true because the new covenant contains nine out of the Ten Commandments. Uh, we see that it's because they are under the new covenant now. That's what we are under today. So that's something that we need to recognize in regards to this matter. It's not that hard to understand. Now, here's also, and especially when it comes to instrumental music, is, is it a matter of faith or is it a matter of opinion? So, what I would say in regards to this, if you were going to describe faith, that's God's revealed will. It determines fellowship. It's the basis of unity. We must judge. We must preach. We must contend for. With opinion, it's man's thoughts. We must not. It must not determine fellowship. It may have diversity. It must not judge. It must not preach. It must not contend for. Now, let's let me give some examples that might help us to understand this. We believe that it's it's under faith that we know that Nicodemus came to Jesus by night because that's what it says. But why did he come? Why did why did he come by night? We we're not positive about that. Was it because of, he was afraid? Was it because he got off work that um, he just got off work and finally could come to Jesus? We don't know. That's an opinion that people that someone might say because he was afraid. Now I'm going to contend. Because it is part of worship. God determines how we worship him in spirit and truth. We must worship him in spirit and truth. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So it's by the revealed will of God. And we're going to see that Ephesians 5.19, Colossians 3.16, that it is vocal, it's congregational singing that God desires to have when we're corporately worshiping him. Now, opinion would be, in regards to that, the number of songs that is selected, the verse, sorry, sorry, I spelled that wrong, the verses that are selected. And, you know, if somebody wants to sing, uh, lead, say, um, we're going to lead verses 1, 2, and 4. Or it could be regards to, are we going to use the PowerPoint? Are we going to use song books? We're still singing. It's a matter of opinion. Another matter of faith would be the worship of the Lord on Sunday to partake of the Lord's Supper. That's something that we're commanded to do. But in, in regards to the location where we're going to meet, the time of day on the first day of the week, 
the order of worship that's going to take place, the trays, uh, is that going to be used? Is that, how, is that where we're going to put the elements of the Lord's Supper in? Those are opinions. Uh, when are we going to have the Lord's Supper? At the very beginning, at the very end? That's a matter of opinion. And then the f- faith would be knowing that the remission of sins for immersed penitent believers is an absolute must. Acts 2.38 teaches that. But in regards to, okay, are we to baptize them into a, a baptistry? Are we to have a baptistry at the church building? Are we to have a lake? And, uh, are we going to do the lake? Are we going to do the ocean? Are we going to do the river? Are we going to do it, uh, you know, are they going to are they going to wear their own clothes? Are they going to get into these white garments? Uh, are we going to do it backwards? Are we going to baptize them backwards? Or are we going to baptize them forwards? See, that's a, that's, those are matters of opinion, friends. And, of course, the expedient would be to baptize them in the closest place closest to you, right? <laughs> All right, so anyways, um, the necessity, we, in order to understand the Bible like, we got to understand these distinctions. The necessity for authority in religious matters does matter, friends. Colossians 3, 17 Whatsoever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, meaning we're to do by the authority of Christ. Remember what I said the very first? We're to recognize Jesus as king of our lives. Acts 4, 7 through 12, they were asking, by what name are you doing these things? And Peter responds with the right thing, that we're doing this by the name of Jesus Christ, because there's no other name under heaven by which we can be saved. In Matthew 21, 23 through 27, Jesus was asked this question, by what authority are you doing these things? And I love how Jesus responded, okay, let me ask you this question. The vats of John, where was it from, from heaven or from men? See, that's true. Was that, a, was that from heaven? Yes, it actually was. And see, we're obligated to live and walk by faith. 2 Corinthians 5, verse 7, we walk by faith. Not by sight. Without faith, it's impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is, and he's a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Unless we know how God authorizes, we can't be sure about anything we say or do in the realm of religion. So let me let's think about this. Consider consider all these people that we read about in the Bible: Abel, Noah building the ark, Abraham building an altar to God, Moses and the people building the tabernacle. The Israelites approaching God through the Levitical priests. The Israelite men gathering for Jerusalem for three times per year. God commanding, I mean, sorry, David commanded instrumental music and worship. Old Testament characters practicing polygamy and offering incense. Now, let me ask these questions. And these are very important questions. If I can do these things, and I must do these things, how can I know that I can, and how can I know that I must? Second question. If I cannot do these things, I must not do these things. How can I know that I cannot or must not do these things? How do we decide? How do we ascertain Bible authority for these matters? And let me just tell you this, and this is very, very important. I know a lot of people who are very, very, very sincere. I don't doubt the sincerity of people. I'm sure they have great sincerity. But just because you have sincerity does not make it sufficient. And a good example of that is Uzzah. I mean, we're going to see that uh, in, in a moment. I meant to put Uzzah there, not Uzziah, although um, Uzziah is one that we want to talk about. But you think about whatever is not authorized by God is not acceptable to God, even if it's intended to be acceptable. Even if you say, well, I intend this to be acceptable. You can only offer to God true worship by faith. And faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. And so, for regards to Cain, he did not offer an acceptable sacrifice. Nadab and Abihu, we'll learn more about them. David and Uzzah, we'll learn more about that. The sinful pragmatism of Saul, he thought, well, if it works... Hey, let's do it, you know? Or even in Jeroboam. Now, Jeroboam's a really good example. And, but, uh, sorry, I shouldn't say really good example. He's a sad, a sad example. Sorry, I should have said he's a sad example of sadly how we can apostatize from God 
And that's the truth of the matter, friends. I mean, because I don't think sometimes we really think about these things. I really don't. Like, I'm going to give you an example of this. So let's go to 1 Kings 12, and I want to show you all something. 1 Kings 12. And let's just read a little bit here. Okay. All right, we're going to go down. Okay. Therefore the king asked advice, made two calves of gold, said to the people, It is too much for you to go up to Jerusalem. Here are your gods, O Israel, which brought you up from the land of Egypt. And he set one in Bethel, and the other he put in Dan. Now this same became a sin, for the people went to worship before the one as far as Dan. He made shrines on the high places. Now notice this. Made priests from every class of people who were not of the sons of Levi. Does it really matter what tribe was prescribed? According to God, it was. It really mattered. And yet here's Jeroboam saying, you know what? We're going to pick all sorts of people from, uh, from uh, different tribes. Jeroboam ordained a feast on the 15th day of the 8th month, like the feast that was in Judah, offered sacrifices on the altar. So he did at Bethel, sacrificed the calves that he had made, and at Bethel he installed the priests of the high places which he had made, and so on and so forth. So, so he ordained a feast on the 15th day of the 8th month. He changed the time. Does that really matter? Well, it matters to God. It matters to God, my friends. In fact, at the very end, if I remember right, I might be wrong. Um, somewhere, oh yeah, yeah, there. In the month which he had devised in his own heart. He devised this in his own heart. Did, did Jeroboam trust in his own heart? Yes, he did. I think it's Proverbs 28. He who trusts in his own heart is a fool. But whoever walks wisely will be delivered. Okay, the one further. So... We need to recognize that God will not tolerate that which is not authorized. Now, the law of rationality is drawing conclusions that are only warranted by the evidence. Which means that when we're interpreting the Bible, gather all the relevant evidence over on a subject or a question you might have. Look at the content, look at the meaning of the words, grammatical relationship of words and sentences. Look at the context. Look at the literary context. Look at the specific sentence. Look at the remote context. Look at the whole context of the whole chapter. Look at the whole Bible in regards to this. And look at the historical context. Look at the time. Look at the culture, which might involve geographical features, might involve topographical features. Look at the occasion of the book. Look at the genre of the book. Handle the evidence correctly. What did it mean? What does it mean? And then draw only such conclusions that are warranted by the evidence. So think about it this way. If man is made such, a what, such that he seeks God, and we see this in Acts 17, Paul talks about this great principle, that man is made to seek God. Then a special revelation from God is necessary because God, he loves man. He wants man to know him. If a special revelation from God is necessary, then it would be the either written Oral or straight to the heart? Well, we see that if it's written down in a record, it's permanent, friends. It's where everyone could read that. So if it's written, which I think all of us would agree that the Bible claims to be the Word of God, but also supported by evidence, divine uh, predicted prophecy, scientific foreknowledge, and so forth, then it would be objective because it's something outside of ourselves that we all have. And if it's objective, then it'll be propositional. It has, it's written in a sense, senses that can be understood. We've talked about how we can understand the Bible. And if it's propositional, then the principle 
principles of biblical interpretation would apply. And we, we that's what we see. And this is this is basically common sense. This really is. It's common sense that we're reasoning correctly. So there's commands or direct statements, which really, honestly, is a, through implication. And we know that implication is part of this. We know that expediency, which we're talking about, remember we're talking about baptism. Yes, the truth is that baptism is for the remission of sins. It's immersion, it's burial. But whether we do it in a pool, whether we do it in a lake or an ocean, that's expedient. It's depending on where you are in the world. <laughs> um, and then there's the accounts of action history that we can learn from those. And, and Paul talks about you, you need to learn from old Israel that not, you shouldn't be like them. You shouldn't be as they were idolaters and grumbling and complaining and, and they were fornicating. So we need to learn from that. And think about it this way. I mean, we can think about Noah, for example, in Genesis 6, 14 through 22, where God gives him instructions to make the ark from gopher wood, to make it inside and outside with pitch. For it, make it, if, it, if the estimates are, you know, the if the cubits are 18 inches long, as we assume, it's 450 feet, feet long, 75 feet long, 45 feet high, in which it has a roof or, or a window that's a, like an 18-inch opening for that light and ventilation to go through to go into it's three floors or three decks it's males and females of every kind even in regards to that status of clean and unclean um, and then Noah did all that God commanded him Noah did he fulfilled all the details that God told him to do so not why did Noah follow God's command so precisely because he respected God he loved God he feared God rever- reverentially And he was saved by God's grace through an obedient faith, through an obedient trust. We understand that to be the truth. With Moses and the tabernacle, what did that entail? It's really interesting. You have the furniture, the Ark of the Covenant, the mercy seat, table of showbread, lampstand, altar of incense. And then you have all those coverings, which you can read about in Exodus 26, 1 through 14. And you can see that it's very detailed there. We see that there's the gold overlaid boards and rods, the veil and the curtain, the bronze altar, the courtyard, and how to make the measurements exactly, and the gate. In addition, there were various utensils for carrying out the services of the tabernacle. We see that not only the details were given, but also included were the specifics regarding the assembly. <coughs> Sorry. The assembly, the transportation and function of the tabernacle. We see that there were designated people to assemble and transport the ark. The Kohathites carry the holy things. The Gershonites carry the coverings. The sons of Mirai carry the boards, the bars, and sockets. Is all this simply useless detail? Did it really matter? Yes, it actually did matter. Because in Leviticus 10, 1 through 3, Nedab and Abihu offered strange fire, offered unauthorized fire before God, and they were killed for it. We see in 1 Chronicles 13 that Uzzah, he died touching the ark, and I'm sure he was very sincere. But the fact of the matter is, they did not follow the proper order, as 1 Corinthians 15, 2 and 13 discuss. In Leviticus 16, verse 2, it's not just any time, but when God said to do it. And in 1 Corinthians Chronicles 17, 1, verse 2 and 4 through 6, of building a building for God. You know, it's interesting. Here is David. He He's seeking to want to build God a house for him to dwell in because he's living in a palace himself. And yet God tells him, you're not going to build this. You're a man of war, but your son Solomon's going to build it. Now, that's very interesting to me. Here he has the best of intentions. What if David had had constructed a temple? What if he said, you know, I know God did what you said, but I'm going to do this anyways. He would have been rebellious against God. He would have sinned against God. See, the fact of the matter is, here's an interesting thing. We're, we know that we're not to go out and build an ark. That wasn't to us. We're not Noah. We know, we know by common sense, by reasoning correctly, that we're not to go out and make a tabernacle and all that, that entails. But we, are, we do know this. We serve as a Christian. If we're Christians, we serve in the greater tabernacle. Hebrews 9, 11, and 23 and 24 talk about this. And if we have any respect for God, 
If we have any respect for Bible authority, we will do what God says in the way that he said to do it, even in, even in regards to details that he gives it. We will pay attention to those details. We will dare not to be rebellious or careless towards God, but so many are. You know, there are many accounts of action in the Bible, some good, some bad. I mean, think about, for example, with Barnabas. He actually went to his uh, the island of Cyprus, went and sold that land, and came back and gave the money to be laid at the apostles' feet. Well, is that something for us today? Well, we learn, actually, with Ananias and Sapphira, that Peter says it was a volunteer fairly act upon their part. Was it not your own? And it, it was. So that's how we can learn from the context that this something is, is not binding on us today. But if we want to do it, if you want to sell a piece of property and you want to give the money to the church, you can do that freely. What Israel did was also an example of what not to do. We read that in 1 Corinthians 10, verse 6 and 11. So you could put this in a what's called the uh, square of opposition. Are all accounts of action in the Bible are binding? No accounts of action in the Bible are binding? Some accounts of action in the Bible are binding? Some actions of the, uh, accounts of action in the Bible are not binding? Well, we learn that it can't be all accounts, as we just saw, um, you know, for example, with Noah building the ark or with uh, Moses building the tabernacle. So it can't be all accounts. It can't be no accounts because there are some examples, right? We learned that we're to learn from old Israel. We're to learn, be an example. Uh, follow the, like Paul told Timothy, be an example to the, uh, in your youth to the believers, in purity, and, and so forth. And so that's an example that I'm to follow. And then there are some accounts of action in the Bible that are binding, like try, trying to follow an footsteps of Jesus. That if we have to suffer, then we will suffer. Hupo gramos, hupo, to write under. So like, interesting how that was used, that a teacher would write, for example, the letter, capital letter A. So you have a student come up to the board, and they copy that same letter we're to copy jesus and then of course there's that principle of faith and obedience that follow the, those great examples of faith not the same actions but uh, we can follow the same principle that they're great examples to us but then we see as a case that some accounts in action in the bible are not binding like barnabas which we just talked about and judas hanging himself that's not for us today either so we see that it's some actions are binding, some actions are not binding. Well, how do we know? How, we have to examine and distinguish those distinctions. So, to give you some examples of this, think about foot washing, for example. So, foot washing is done in John 13, 4 through, 5, 4 through 15. We know this was done in the upper room. And foot washing was a courtesy when entering a home. During those, during, it's a culture thing during that time, and it's, I think it's a culture thing, cultural thing in some parts of the world in the East. Uh, Peter's response was to show that it was not the role of one hired to wash a lower one's feet. Right, the Lord was teaching what we need to get this across is what the main point was. It wasn't the foot washing, the specific action of that. It was actually the service to people that that we're to give to people. That's what Jesus wants us to learn. So it's actually the humble service that we're to give to others is what that's talking about. What about the holy kiss? You know, greet one another with a holy kiss. Well, we see that that was a cultural mode of greeting during that time. And, and still even prominent in some parts of the world uh, today and other places. But we see it was a command, but, you know, in our culture... In Western culture, what we would do is we would shake someone's hand. Holy handshake, <laughs> you could say. But the word holy is describing that kind of kiss. It shouldn't be motivated by sensual desire. It's not a kiss that me it should not be a means to hide hypocrisy. And so the way that we could, you know, give this today is, you know, if you're shaking someone's hand, you say, How are you doing, brother? You're doing great. I love you so much. 
I hope you're really doing well. Meanwhile, you're sadly uh, sabotaging them by talking behind their back and and you're gossiping about them and you're doing mean things towards them and basically being a hypocrite. That would not be right to do. So that's something that we need to learn from. But the Lord's Supper, you know that we know that was instituted by the Lord on a Thursday night prior to the crucifixion. But we see as a commandment from Paul in 1 Corinthians 11. But how do we know what day to do it upon? How frequent? Well, Acts 20, verse 7, Acts 2, 42 says they continue the apostle doctrine and the breaking of the bread in prayers and the fellowship. And Acts 20, verse 7 says they did this on the first day of the week. Well, how often does the first day of the week come? Well, every first every week, right? And the church came together in one place to eat the supper. That was the purpose of why they came. So how often did the church come together? Well, it's interesting in 1 Corinthians 16, 1 and 2. Now, upon the first day of the week, let each one of you lay aside as he has stored in regards to that collection for the saints. But the reason that Paul obviously was giving that commandment was because they were already meeting on the first day of the week. They were in that already uh, divine directive to come to assemble to worship on Sunday. So that's something that we need to learn from by an account of action. What about implication? Well, implication is not mere assertion. It's not just personal interpretation. It's not just wishful thinking. It's actually a logical relationship among the terms of a proposition in which one derives or ascertains or deduces truths which lie inherently in the terms of explicit propositions. And implication conclusions are necessitated and cannot be avoided. Now, We've been using implication throughout this lesson. You probably may not just realize, we, we may not have realized it. That which the Bible teaches explicit, implicitly is just as true and binding as what which teaches explicitly. The authority inherent in that which is implied lies into the fact that I've reasoned correctly. I'm sorry. I forgot something in here. The authority inherent in that which is implies lies um, lies not in the sorry lies not in the fact that I have reason correctly regarding an explicit statement, but the fact that God implied it already. Now, uh, here's a good example. So we might use Bill is taller than Jack. Jack is taller than John. Therefore, it's implicitly true that Bill is taller than Jack. That's implication. If we were to use geometry, you know, we could say this square has one side 12 inches long. Well, so I say that explicitly, but implicitly, you can know that the three other sides, because you know what a square looks like, they got to be 12 inches on each out of the other three sides. We know that if you do the perimeter, it'd be 144, sorry, 140, 48 inches. If you uh, do the area of the square, it's 144 inches. And we know that there's four right angles. So the implication authorizes the Bible to be personally applied. So I think about Mark 16, 16. Go into all the world, preach the gospel of every creature. He who believes and is baptized shall be saved, but he who does not believe will be condemned. Is my name mentioned there? Not explicitly, but implicitly. Where do I find my name in the text? So are we commanded to be baptized to be saved? Are we commanded to believe to be saved? Yes and yes. How can we know this without applying the principles of implication? Implication also authorized that Saul repented of his sins. You know, Scripture does not explicitly state that Saul repented there in Acts chapter 9, but no person can become a Christian without repenting. These, these um, times of ignorance God wants to overlook, but now commands all men everywhere to repent. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins. Saul of Tarsus did become a Christian. We know this. Therefore, Saul, in becoming a Christian, did repent of his sins. We know that there's implication authorizes us in partaking of the Lord's Supper every Sunday because the Sunday assembly is for the purpose of partaking of the Lord's Supper. You read that. They came together to break bread. The Lord's Day meeting was a weekly affair, 1 Corinthians 16, 1 2. So everything in the Bible is either given explicitly or implicitly. My name is not written in the Bible, but I can know that Acts 17.30 is binding on me because I am a man who has sinned against God. 
and in, in need of repenting in order to be saved. Think about Acts 2, 25 through 28. Let's read this scripture here. I think this is interesting. Acts 2, 25 through 28. For David says concerning him, I foresaw the Lord always before my face, for he is at my right hand that I may not be shaken. Therefore my heart rejoiced, my tongue was glad. Moreover, my flesh also will rest in hope. For you will not leave my soul in Hades, nor will you allow your Holy One to see corruption. You have made known to me the ways of life. You will make me full of joy in your presence. And notice, notice the logical conclusions that Peter goes to here. Men and brethren... Let me speak freely to you of the patriarch David, that he's both dead and buried. His tomb is with us to this day. Therefore, being a prophet and knowing that God has sworn with an oath to him that of the fruit of his body, according to the flesh, he would raise up the Christ to sit on his throne. He, foreseeing this, spoke concerning the resurrection of the Christ, that his soul was not left in Hades, nor did his flesh see corruption. This Jesus God has raised up, of which we are all witnesses. So David wrote the psalm, Psalm 16. We know that David could not be referring to himself because here he is dead in the tomb. He's There's corruption there. He's, I mean, the bones have wasted away probably by now. <laughs> Thus, David must have been referring to his descendant, Jesus, and speaking as a prophet. That's what we need to think about the implications there. Matthew 22, 29 through 33, when, you know, the Sadducees were trying to get Jesus, uh, test him, in regards to the resurrection and which of these shall be uh, the hu- uh, which of these shall be uh, the seven husbands shall be her the uh, sorry which of one of these shall the wife oh, man which one of these seven husbands hus- seven husbands shall the wife shall the wife have but they all had her okay so Jesus said they're mistaken they do not know the scriptures nor the power of God there's no marriage in the resurrection in fact it's very really interesting that that Jesus gives a tense, I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, not I was, meaning that they were still living somewhere. They're still in existence. So, once again, Jesus is, used, Jesus is using implication for us to understand the scriptures. Now, let's think about this. Is hearing necessary in order to be saved? I mean, is it for one to believe? But it's also to be saved. Romans 10, 14 through 17, to me, is one of the strongest uh, uh, sorry, Romans 10, 14. So, how then shall they call on him? Let me show this to you guys. I think it's important. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? How shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? How shall they hear without a preacher? How shall they preach unless they are sent, as written? How beautiful are the feet of those who preach the gospel peace, who bring glad tidings of good things, but they have not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed our report? Now, um, so is hearing necessary in order to be believed? Well, how shall they call? How Paul asked this question: How shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? So obviously, you must hear in order to believe. Now think about it this way: Also, is it necessary to believe in order to be saved? If you believe I'm not He, you will die in your sins. Without faith, it is impossible to please him, for he who comes to God must believe that he is, and he's rewarded those who diligently seek him. Is it necessary for one to repent in order to be saved? Well, Acts 17, verse 30, which we already quoted, says, Yes, God commands all men everywhere to repent. Is it necessary for one to confess Jesus as the Son of God? Because confession is unto salvation. Is it necessary for one to be immersed in the name of Jesus Christ in water unto the remission of sins? Well, Mark 16, 16, Acts 2, 3, and many other passages show that to be the case. Is it necessary for one to walk in the light as Jesus is in the light? 1 John 1, 7 through 9. Yes, friends. And so we see implication here. 
we see that when you look at these cases of conversion, you see that not all the conditions are mentioned, but they are implied. Just for example, let's just take Acts 2.38. There was teaching already done. They heard the word of God. They believed it. That's implied because they cried out, men and brethren, what shall we do? They, it's confessing is implied. We know that they were repented of their past sins because they were told to repent. They were commanded to repent and to be baptized in order to receive the remission of sins. And so you can see here on this chart where these things would be implied because God is just and fair with everyone. Well, when it comes to the elements of worship, even there's not one passage that lists all the elements of worship in the New Testament church today. In fact, we go to Acts 2.42, we see there's teaching of the apostles' doctrine, there's prayers, there's a breaking of the bread. They sang together, Ephesians 5.19, Colossians 3.16. The church assembled to break bread and gave. In 1 Timothy 2.1-8, through 8, we see the word to pray to God. And here's the interesting thing. So... It's implied that we're to take all those things and put it together. And that's why we have the preaching of the Word of God. That's why we have singing. That's why we have praying. That's why we have uh, the Lord's Supper. And that's why we can have the contribution. Now, think about something in regards to this, friends. When we think about this issue of instrumental music, that there's actually the law of Moses at the first, did not specify the place of worship, but God said he would choose the place. And finally, God chose Jerusalem, where David took the Ark of the Covenant and where Solomon built the temple. And think about how Jeroboam changed this. He changed it from Jerusalem to Dan and Bethel. He did that which was unauthorized. Now, here's where I want you to start seeing that there's going to be a change a change in the system of things, that we're called to worship God in spirit and in truth. Now, I'll show you John 4, 24. So, Jesus is talking to the Samaritan woman at Jacob's well. And here is what's being discussed. So, she says, Sir, I perceive that you're a prophet. Our fathers, the Samaritans, she's referring to, that worshipped on this mountain, Mount Gerizim. And you Jews say that in Jerusalem is a place where one ought to worship. Now, was the Jews correct about that matter? Yes, because God designated that is where they were to worship him. Now, Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when you will neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we worship, for salvation is of the Jews. But the hour is coming, and now is, when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father is seeking such to worship Him. God is spirit, and those who worship Him must worship in spirit and truth. That's a necessity, my friends. Must. That makes it very, very important. Now, I want you to notice that <clears throat> the tabernacle had been built according to the pattern God revealed to Moses and likewise the temple in Jerusalem. And then God through David designated the site but said that Solomon was to build it. And God also chose the pattern and you're welcome to look at all those verses. Now, here's the thing. The Samaritans believe in the existence of the true God of the Bible. The God of the Bible is ought to be worshipped. They even believed in the first five books of Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. 
They believed them to be inspired, to be authoritative, but they rejected the rest of the Old Testament. And that means they were responsible even though they had rejected further revelation because they should have accepted, uh, you know, Joshua, Drew, all the way to Malachi. Although the Jews were right, there was change that was coming. Well, when would this change take place? Well, the law of Moses would have to, would have to remain enforced during Jesus' ministry. He had to fulfill it, Matthew 5, 17, 18. So Christ's death was essential to the removal of the law of Moses and the establishment of the new covenant. Remember how Jesus said, but the hour is coming and now is. So the coming of something in the future in which the processes were at work even now. So a good point in regards to this was John 5, 24 through 29, in which Jesus there, and I, can't, I don't have time to go through all this, but Jesus is discussing two resurrections. One resurrection was occurring there at that time in that those who hear and believe and obey, they will undergo a spiritual resurrection. And that's what is going on today in that when you obey the gospel, you are died of that old man of sin, buried and walk, buried and are raised to walk in newness of life. That's a resurrection. But we also see where our, this body here is awaiting a new a, a, a new body. So the general future resurrection from the dead has not occurred yet. It's still in the future. And we're waiting for that one. And that's the one that John 5, 20, 29 is talking about. So the chain, this, um, so the coming of something in the future in which the processes are at work even now, that Jesus is desiring there to be true worshipers who worship the Father in spirit and truth. So, John 4, 20-24 embodies a contrast between worship under the Old and New Covenant. So, first, Jesus contrasted worship in spirit and truth with worship in Jerusalem. It would not be in a place as such, not in a physical location, but in spirit and truth. Stated negatively, Jesus pointed to a time when neither in this mountain nor in Jerusalem shall ye worship the Father, but say it positively, he said, the hour comes when the true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and truth. Second, the change in contrast is indicated by the statement Jesus made after showing that the Jews were right. He said, but, and this contrasted the time of Israel's prerogative with its abolition and establishment of worship in spirit and truth. Third, the contrast included the temple, for it was the place of worship. Fourth, the contrast was between the two systems of worship, because we can learn this from other passages like Colossians 2, Hebrews 9, Hebrews 10, and so forth. So what's a contrast that cannot be? Well, the interpretation that it is referring to spirit being sincerity. Uh, now, this is, a, this is a view that I once held, okay? I, I admit to this, and I'm wrong now. I, I admit I was, I'm wrong, and um, I want to do better about interpreting the Bible uh, better. But I used to think that spirit and truth was referring to sincerity and that truth refers to God's word. Well, that cannot be the case because even sincerity was required under the Old Testament. Hypocrisy was not tolerated. Worship was also not acceptable when they honored God with their lips, but if their heart was not if their hearts were far from God, then of course it was in vain. So sincerity was also uh, to be implemented under the Old Testament. Well, it also can't be truth because were they not to worship according to the truth of God's word under the Old Covenant system and what God had directed them to do? Yeah, of course. So, because if truth was not required, the Samaritans were just as right as the Jews were. But the Jews, they were right about where to worship God, the right place, which was Jerusalem at that time. But we see as a case that that's not what 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 uh, we're referring to. I think what we see here is the contrast between what we call the cardinal ordinances of the old covenant worship and the spiritual nature of the worship of the New Testament, uh, new covenant worship. The contrast between the shadows of the old covenant worship and the substances of the new covenant worship. Hebrews nine nine ten. Now let me. Let me read Hebrews 9, 9, 10 so you can get what I'm saying here. Hebrews 9, 9, 
It was symbolic for the present time in which both gifts and sacrifices are offered, which cannot make him who perform the service perfect in regards to the conscience, concerned only with foods and drinks, various washings, and fleshly ordinances imposed until the time of reformation. But Christ came as high priest of the good things to come with the greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is, not of this creation. In fact, I, I thought Westcott had a good um, point with this. That part of man's nature which holds or is capable of holding intercourse with the eternal order is the spirit. The spirit of man responds to the spirit of God. Compare John 6, 63, which says, It is spirit uh, that gives life. They, they are spirit and they are life. The sphere of worship was therefore now to be the highest region where the divine and human meet and no... Um, and not, sorry, and not as in an earlier period of discipline, material or fleshly. The Israel constituted a typical people with a typical system tied with a physical land and with a physical temple in a physical place, which was Jerusalem. But that system was temporary. First, it was part of the old covenant, which had been abolished. Second, its kings and priests are now replaced by Jesus, who is our king and our priest. Third, the shadow has given way to the substance. Fourth, in fulfilling a prophecy, the temple was destroyed, right, in AD 70. Fifth, Jesus taught that the temple system would cease. Sixth, since Christ's work is universal and not national, his religion cannot be tied down to a land, a city, and a physical temple. And seventh, the law of Moses as a tutor has given way to Christ. Eighth, the temple is, uh, the physical temple in Jerusalem is forbidden to Christians. We do not have its ordinances of divine service, such as the priesthood, the animal sacrifices, the trumpets, and other instruments. See, Christ's church is the temple of God, which Jesus himself built and is continuing to build. Every conversion to Christ is a new and living stone of that spiritual temple. And we're under Christ's authority, and we have no more right to add to his temple and its worship than to the people under the old covenant. Although we do not have Old Testament circumcision, we are the circumcision. We worship by the Spirit of God and glory in Christ Jesus and have no confidence in the flesh. Our circumcision was the cutting off of the bodies of the sins of the flesh in, what, in, in when we were baptized into Christ. Um, uh, we were forgiven of our past sins. We follow Jesus outside the camp of Judaism and therefore its priests are not our priests. Christ is our high, high priest who understands us. He understands our sympathies. He understands us as we are. And no human priest stands between us and Christ because we ourselves, who are Christians, we are priests. Now, it's interesting. We're not expressly told not to have the altar of Exodus 40, verse 10, or the golden altar of incense. But we're told that if we serve the tabernacle, we have no right to the new covenant altar. Which means that this would be forbidden to have. Our mercy seat is not sprinkled with the blood of animals, but we have access to the throne of God. The throne of grace occupied by Christ is our high priest who makes intercession for us. We cannot make an offering for sin, but for Christ has made the one, the sufficient and the only offering which can take away sins. So what sort of sacrifices do we offer as Christians? Where our bodies and our all their members, our hands, our feet are to be offered unto God as instruments of righteousness. Our deed. Sacrifices are composed of doing good unto all men, especially those of the house of our faith, of our giving. That's a sweet-smelling aroma unto God. Our, the word sacrifice is a sacrifice of praise unto God. Those are expressed in prayer and confession of Christ and in singing to God. See, if we return to Abraham, you know what Abraham would do? He would point us to Christ because it's through his seed all the nations of the earth would be blessed. If we return to Melchizedek, he would return us to Christ because he is the antitype to Christ because Christ is the true king and priest. We see that if we return to Moses, Moses is going to point us to the prophet that we are to hear, that we're to listen to, that we're to obey. Deuteronomy 18, 15 through 18. 
in Acts 3, 22 and 23. If we return to Jeremiah, Jeremiah, he prophesied about the new covenant that we would be under. If we return to the old Jerusalem, it would tell us to seek the new Jerusalem. That And Hebrews 12, 22 and Hebrews 13, 13 and 14 talk about that. If we seek, if we return to the Old Testament prophets, they're going to send us to the Christ for the salvation that they prophesied about. If we return to the having an Old Testament high priest, well, that was actually an antitype. I mean, sorry, a type of that which was to come, which would be Christ's priesthood after the order of Melchizedek. If we return to the Old Testament sacrifices, its worship and its temple, it tells us that we should go to the new covenant worship, which was of which that old covenant worship was just shadows and types. If we seek through the old temple, its priesthood, its sacrifices for the way into heaven, it tells us that it did not make the way manifest, but Christ, he does. He does make the way manifest for us to enter into. If we ask the Levitical priesthood to make an offering for sin, it tells us that the system of types has ceased, that they have no power to function for their priesthood has ended and there can be no more offering for sin it's sacrifices were insufficient and that it cannot bring perfection in fact when you think about it, these old testament sacrifices they were pointing to the new testament altar that you and i can serve uh, under today these incense offerings they were that was pointing to our prayers that we offer up to god we think about the fleshly circumcision that was pointing to the spiritual circumcision of the heart uh, we see that that's what the Bible talks about. We think about the cardinal fleshly ordinances. They were pointing to the spiritual worship, spiritual service that we offer unto God today. And so you see, the reason we should study obedience as we consider the kind of music as we should use in Christian worship is because we must worship God in spirit and in truth. The Bible reveals that God reacts as strongly to worship violations as he does to immorality as he does the crimes against humanity and other acts of rebellion towards his will. And loving, obedient respect for God is paramount with him. If we truly love Christ, we will keep his commandments. You know, it's interesting that Cain's works were actually called evil in the Bible. I think that's very interesting in 1 John 3, verse 12. But Abel did works which were righteous in the sight of God. Nadab and Abihu failed to use the right fire in burning incense in the tabernacle. Now let me ask you this. I think this is something very interesting to think about. Did God, base, did he create fire? Well, we know God created everything. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. God created the what would have been discovered as the periodic table of elements, right? And when you look up the chemical, chemical compositions of fire, its primary is made up of carbon dioxide, water vapor, oxygen, nitrogen, and so on and so forth. And you can read about how you know, it's made. But let me add, but think about it this way. Did God create music? Well, God created everything, right? God created our vocal cords to be able to sing. And I think it's interesting. I got to look at Paul's, uh, his own vocal cords. He actually showed a video one time of that. And uh, Okay, it was a little bit disgusting, but it was actually also pretty interesting. But God cre- also created the components that humans would would be able to make the, the, the musical instruments, right? Now, here's, here's what I'm tr- trying to get at. Is God the great communicator? Is he able to communicate to those Israelite priests what kind of fire he commanded them to get? And the answer is yes. Is God the great communicator able to communicate to us what kind of music he commands us to give to God, to give to him? And the answer is yes, he does. I mean, Saul, he offered a sacrifice that only priests were to offer, 1 Samuel 13, 9 through 14. Uzzah was struck dead for touching the Ark of the Covenant, the care of that which was the responsibility of the Levites in the first place. Jeroboam made his own authorized, unauthorized forms of worship. We've covered that. And because Uzziah, who was not a priest, entered the temple to burn incense, he became a leper and retained his leprosy for the rest of his life. And you can read about that in 2 Chronicles 26, 16 through 21. You see, obedience is a willing response to the instructions of another. It includes doing what is commanded um, and refraining from doing what, what is not commanded and what is forbidden. And in many cases, obedience does not seek or ask a reason, but accepts the demands of another. If God gives a reason for the action, well, God, obedience means responding for that reason. 
The motivating force that God desires behind our obedience is love, hope, and faith. So why does this matter? Because in the areas of religion and behavior, what are the guiding principles for our choices that people have adopted? Well, some people say, well, I just want to do what I want to do. Everyone did that which was right in his own eyes. Some do what their conscience approves of. Well, Saul learned that lesson that he had lived in all good conscience till this day. He did not recognize that he was sinning against God. And in some do traditions because that's all they've ever been grown up with. You know, authority is a key issue in what one does in the name of the Lord. And God expects that whatever man does should be done in the name of or by his authority. So the question arises, how do we know if something is from God? We can know the truth. We must allow Scripture to be the director for all that we say and do. Some rebel against authority and they want to do things their own way. But friends, the devil wants you to be just like him. He wants you to rebel just like he did. And are we going to be like him? See, God is not authorized by my personal likes or dislikes. It's not, oh, I like instrumental music or I hate instrumental music. That's not what I go by. It's not what pleases me. It's what pleases God. It's not about the erroneous conclusions that I might reach because that's what Nick Naaman did. I just thought you would wave your hand across the house, Elisha. Well, that may be what you thought, but that's not what God said for you to do. You must wash in the Jordan River seven times. It's not about what's popular, and certainly today, instrumental music is certainly popular in a lot of different religious groups. It's not what my friend and family says or believes. It's not what my preacher says or believes. It's not even what a well-known preacher says. It's not even about human traditions, because those can be those uh, can be vain. It's not my inability to see any harm in it, because us is certainly, uh, and of course, need to have in a bayou. All of them, they recognize the harm after they had disobeyed God. It's not about long-standing practices on what we've always done or what we've always believed or what I feel in my heart. Because it's not about your feelings. It's about what God says. Now, here's the thing about, about this matter. We need to recognize that some people today, they may have assumed that God has always asked for the worship in the same manner that, they've all, that, that he's always done. But if we're honest, we know that that's not true because we know that there's the patriarchal age, there's the mosaic age, and there's the Christian age. We recognize that there's a creation of the world that goes up to, well, for the Israelites, it goes to Exodus 20, where they're given the law of Moses. But for the rest of the Gentiles, it continues on even until Cornelius, when the door of the gospel is open to the Gentiles around AD 33. The Mosaic Age started from around 1450, so to speak, to about 30 AD when it was the law of Moses was taken away at the cross. But it was always only for the Jews. And then the Christian Age starts with AD 30, starts with the Jews first. Gospel goes to them first. But then it goes to the Gentiles, and we're all amenable to the gospel of Christ. You know, it's really interesting in the patriarchal age. I mean, you can see Abel, he offers animal sacrifices. Noah does, Job's friends, Abraham, Moses. Now, when we think about these definitions, what, what I'm going to show you now is, um, this is here's a book here. Make sure you can read it here. Songs, Symbols, and Tambourines, the Music of Scripture by Richard Wolfe. And what Richard did was he actually went through the whole Old Testament and did a study about music in the Old Testament. And I think it's a really interesting study. And he talks about how secular music, there's non-religious music, so that not all music that the Bible mentions is for worship. There's signals in that there's the trumpets and the ram horns or the shofar were used to call the people to come and gather for a special meeting. And then there's the worship. There's the music of worship, but not all of worship was pleasing to God. So, Interesting that there is the first five books of Moses. You have Jubal, Sia as a father of musicians, Genesis 4.21. Laban offered to throw a party complete with music, a normal going away party, but obviously it's not related to worship. There's a signal to call the people together, Exodus 19, 12, and 13. There's Exodus 15, 1 through 19, the celebration of Thanksgiving to God. 
There's Exodus 15, 20, where Miriam, the prophetess, goes out with the women, and it's probably most likely responsive singing with the company of instrumental music and in that there was the, the timbrel. I think, I think it's a timbrel. Um, Exodus 15, 28. But notice she's a prophetess, meaning that she has to follow the directives of the, of the word of God. So I think it's kind of interesting that she's called that there. Exodus, well, there is no Exodus fifteen twenty eight. What did I mean? Oh, verse, uh, verse twenty. I'm sorry. Um, then Mary and the prophetess, sister of Aaron, took the timbrel in her hand. And all the women went out after with timbrels and with dances. And Miriam answered them, Sing to the Lord, for he has triumphed gloriously, the horse and his rider he has thrown into the sea. Okay. Um, then you have Exodus 19, verse 13, the signal to summon the people there at the mountain. Um, and you can read about a lot of these. I, I want to place these here so that you can read them for yourself. There's one particular one that I want to talk about because I think it's very, very important. And it's very, um, it's not this one, but this is worth mentioning. Numbers 10, 1 through 10, they were to make two silver trumpets. It was used to summon the people of Israel. And what's interesting is there's a restriction that the pre, uh, if you read Numbers 10, verse 8, it says, The sons of Aaron, the priests, shall blow the trumpets. So it's a restriction only to the sons of Aaron, the priest. And then Numbers 21, 17, 18, we see Israel sing a song. Um, and you can read these here. I want to get to something very interesting. So I'm going to let you read these for yourself if you'd like. Uh, these are for your study. Joshua, Judges, and Ruth. And then there's 1 Samuel. You can read about that. 2 Samuel through 2 Chronicles. So here's where Israel's history begins to change drastically during this period, and Jerusalem would be built into a capital city. The worship liturgy would be reorganized, and the temple would be built. So you can read about how the Ark of the Covenant in 2 Samuel 6 was brought with singing from kirjath Jerem, but the moving of it was halted after Uzzah was struck dead for touching the Ark, and David left it with Obed-Edom. Later, the Ark was brought to Jerusalem with singing, animal sacrifices and musical instruments, harps, cymbals, lyres, and tr trumpets, which were blown after the ark was placed inside the tabernacle. Now, um, I'll let you read 1 Kings, if you want to read those for yourself. 2 Kings. Now, here's the interesting thing about First and Second Chronicles that I really want us to study about. Who played what and when? Well, in 1 Chronicles 16, you'll see it describes the reorganization of tabernacle worship. 1 Chronicles 23 gives the general Levite groupings that David ordered in anticipation of the temple Solomon had, would build. And in 1 Chronicles 25, there's a specific information about the assignments of the Levites with musical jobs. And then in 1 Chronicles 16 and 16 and 7, David had Asaph and his relatives sing a song of thanksgiving to God. Um, you have Psalms 105, 96, and 106. Um you can read about that if you like. Um, I really want to get to this one here. So what I'm going to show you is this. Why was instrumental music introduced into the worship in the Old Testament? See, this is a very important question. And we're going to see that David, Gad, and Nathan, who were prophets, they did not take it on themselves to add instruments to the worship. It's because God commanded it to be done. Second Chronicles 29, 25. And we're going, to, we're going to look more at that. Now, here's um, yeah, John L. Gurdu, who wrote this in 1888. Um, but it was reprinted in 1983. He was... A Presbyterian, if I remember correctly. So, I wanted to see show you what he says. He says the absence of instrumental music from the services of the tabernacle 
continue not only during the wanderings of the Israelites in the desert, but after their entrance into the promised land, through the protracted period of the judges, the reign of Saul, and a part of David's. Now, when you look at Second Chronicles, and I'm going to... Here's going to be an interesting thing. When, when Hezekiah, he restores worship in Israel, he arranged the Levites to burn offerings and use cymbals, harps, and lyres as they sang praises of God with instruments. And we're going to read that. Um, and I'm going to let you read that too. We, I'd like to get to John Price's book. Now, this is a really good book. It's called Old Light on New Worship. And I want you, he is current, well, I don't know if he still is, but back when this was written in 2005 or 2007, he says he's currently the pastor of Grace Baptist Church in Rochester, New York, where he has served since 1995. And it's very interesting um, that Mr. Price, he says these things which I could have even said. He says, when we read through the historical narratives of 1 Chronicles 13 through 16 and 1 Chronicles 23 through 25, in which David brings the ark to Jerusalem and orders the temple worship. Sorry. We are not told why he brought the singers and the various musical instruments into God's worship. We may be left with the impression that David did so simply out of his own personal desires as a skilled musician. Perhaps David believed it would enhance the wor- experience of worship and make it more festive and glorious. Perhaps the musical instruments had become more important in the culture of David's day and the people found them appealing. We are not told why David used them in the historical narrative. We discovered the reason why David brought musical instruments into God's worship almost 300 years later during the reign of King Hezekiah. After many years of decay and neglect, the temple worship was restored by Hezekiah. And we read in 2 Chronicles 29, 25-27, He then stationed the Levites in the house of the Lord with cymbals, with harps, with lyres, according to the command of David and of Gad the king seer and of Nathan the prophet, for the command was from the Lord through his prophets. And the Levites stood with the musical instruments of David and the priests with the trumpets. Then Hezekiah gave the order to offer the burnt offering on the altar. And when the burnt offering began, the song to the Lord also began with the trumpets, accompanied by the instruments of David, king of Israel. When Hezekiah restored the temple worship, he was faced with the issue of how God should be worshipped. In regards to musical instruments, he needed to answer two questions. First, should musical instruments be used at all in the house of the Lord? And if they should be, what specific instruments should be used? Hezekiah did not assume he had any authority to act in this matter apart from divine command. For both of these commands, he looked for divine authority in regard to the worship of the temple. Hezekiah found that God had authorized only certain musical instruments for his worship. Trumpets and various other musical instruments had been brought into God's worship according to the command of David. Hezekiah limited the musical instruments to only those divinely authorized through David. And the Levites stood with the musical instruments of David and the priests with the trumpets and all that was done according to the command of of David. Now, we ask this question: the question, where did this command of David to bring musical instruments into God's worship come from? Second Chronicles twenty nine twenty five states clearly that David's cam- command came from the Lord. The command was from the Lord through his prophets. Here is the reason why David instituted the Levitical singers and brought other musical instruments into God's worship. It was that they were commanded by God through his prophets Gad and Nathan. David's command was God's command. Even the great king and prophet David had no liberty to alter God's worship because of his own personal desires on musical or musical inclinations. Neither could he make any additions because he believed they would enhance the experience of worship, make it more joyful and glorious. David could act only by divine authority. Just as in the days of the tabernacle worship under Moses, God regulated his temple worship under Moses. God regulated his temple worship under David, even in regards to musical instruments. She says, with Moses, he regulated the specific musical instruments to be used in his worship, the instruments of David, for the command was from the Lord through his prophets. We learn again of the divine authority in regards to the temple and its worship, which came through David in 1 Chronicles 28, 11 through 13 and 19. Then David gave his son Solomon the plans for the vestibule, its, house, its houses, its treasuries, its upper chambers, its inner chambers, and the place of the mercy seat, and the plans for all that he had by the Spirit of the courts of the house of the Lord, of all the chambers all around, of the treasures of the house of God, and of the treasures for the dedicated things, also for the vision 
of the priests and the Levites for all the work and of the service of the house of the Lord and for all the articles of service in the house of the Lord. All this, said David, the Lord made me understand in writing by his hand upon me all the works of these plants. Just as Moses had received a divine revelation concerning all the details of construction and the worship of the tabernacle, so David received a divine revelation concerning all the construction and the worship of the temple. This revelation clearly commanded the institute of the biblical singers with the various musical instruments of David and the trumpets. When the temple, and John R. Gurdow says, when the temple was to be built, its order of worship to be instituted, David received a divine revelation in regard to it. Just as Moses had concerning the tabernacle with its ordinances, instrumental music would not have been constituted an element in the temple worship had not God expressly authorized it by his command. And then going back to John Price again, he says, We have established several important truths concerning musical instruments and public worship from the Old Testament scriptures. First, God has always regulated his worship even in regard to musical instruments in both the tabernacle and the temple. The use of musical instruments in worship has never been a matter of liberty for men to do as they please. The Lord has clearly placed instruments under his own authority in worship. Second, God has regulated even the specific instruments to be used, the trumpet and the tabernacle, and the trumpet with the instruments of David in the temple. Third, the command of David concerning worship included the introduction of Levitical singers, along with the trumpets of Moses and the various other musical instruments called the instruments of David. As will be seen, there were no further additions to the instruments used in the temple, throughout the time of the Old Covenant. And then I like, what I think it's interesting what he says here. Many of the modern advocates of musical instruments claim that the church should bring the instruments of the contemporary culture into the house of God. They reason that as the musical tastes of every generation change, so must the musical instruments used in public worship. This is surely not the view of the writers of the men of the Bible. David first established his instruments of worship under divine direction about 1000 B.C., Hezekiah reestablished those very same instruments about 270 years later. Josiah, Jeshua, and Nehemiah lived 350, 550, 570 years respectively after David. We may assume that cultural changes in musical instrumentation had taken place over the hundreds of years since King David, and especially after the Babylonian captivity. However, when these men restored the temple worship, this was not at all their concern. They did not look to their contemporary culture for what musical instruments to use. Their only concern was to use those instruments God had commanded through David the prophet. More than 500 years after David, Joshua had the priest stand in their apparel with the trumpets and the Levites, the sons of Asaph, with symbols to praise the Lord according to the ordinance of David. And Nehemiah restored only the musical instruments of David, the man of God, according to the command of David. So it's pretty clear. Uh, I thought he did a good job of explaining those matters. Now, you can look in the Psalms here, and you can see how there, there are um, musical instruments that are mentioned there in the Psalms. But that's because David was able to introduce them under the divine command of God, as we saw there in Second Chronicles 29. You can look at Job here, who lived during the patriarchal age. Um, you can see, uh, I'm just giving you some passages to look at later if you'd like um so let me just you can stop take a picture if you like <laughs> um here's something interesting that mr uh, wolf says here um and what he was doing, like I said before, he just looked at the Old Testament. And uh, he says, the music of the entire Old Testament period had certain characteristics. They're often overlooked. For example, in the period prior to David, that is from Adam through Moses and the judges, there is practically no music connected with worship. The question here is not what kind of music, but what music. The worship instructions for the tabernacle given by Moses had no music at all. With the monarchy came change. Worship music during the monarchy is predominantly vocal. And though instruments were used, they functionally function only in support of the text. Instruments are few in type, do not replace the words. The type of instrument chosen did not prevent the player from singing. Players were exclusively Levites, and most of the singing was also by Levitical, pre Levitical groups. The worship music of the monarchical period really gives us a little detail that would apply directly to congregational singing. We should all be aware of the image of the 
We should all be aware of the M well, I don't know what it, 114, 115. Sorry about that. Oh, we should all be aware of the limitations of any argument for Christian worship practices that is based on Old Testament practices. Instruments are present in the Old Testament period, and we cannot say that God was displeased with them. This does not mean that they can be adopted in, for use in the church. Instruments and their use in Old Testament worship were strictly regulated and restricted to certain classes of people. Old Testament worship music did not have wholesale use of instruments. This says little or nothing about what restrictions should be applied to music in the church. It does reveal that God and God alone sets the limits of acceptable worship music. The music of Jewish corp corporate worship was the music expressly commanded by God. Never in Bible history have worshipers been authorized to freely improvise their official worship practices. This restriction, as we have seen, includes the music of worship. At this point in our study, we have not come up with some foolproof argument against instrumental music in the church, nor has that been our purpose. We have found that claiming that Old Testament practices gives a precedent for an extensive use of instruments is a mistake due to the fact that while instruments are present in Old Testament worship settings, that presence is less frequent and less prominent than generally assumed. Those of us who object to instrumental music in Christian worship may be more at ease knowing that an a cappella doctrine for Christian corporate worship does not make the Church of Christ the oddball of biblical history, and we'll see that as we go through history itself. Now, when we think about singing as an act of worship to God, it involves our emotions, it involves our mind, it involves our will. Because we are, uh, when we think about how we implement the will, because it is a command of God, but we're so glad to do it. We're so glad to give praise to God for what he has done through us, through Jesus Christ. And we're doing it with the mind in that we're singing lyrics that are lyrics of truth, that we're singing scriptural truths. And it's definitely educational. It's understanding what I'm singing. It involves meditation and thought. And it does involve the emotions, and it's joyful, it's enthusiastic, but it's also an inward conviction shown in outward expression of thanksgiving. So if I were to make an argument about this matter, is that it would be the authority principle that all acts or activities employed in Christian worship as acts or actions of worship without scriptural authority, either by direct statements, accounts of action, implication, and or expediency, our acts or actions which are sinful and we can show you that we're to do whatever we do we must do it all in the name of the lord jesus and we can look at these passages of scripture must we must worship god in spirit and truth that we are to faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of god and we see that vocal singing is employed as employed in christian worship as an act of worship has scriptural authority by direct statement by implication we can see this in Ephesians 5.19, Colossians 3.16, and a few other passages. Therefore, vocal singing is an act which is not sinful. So why do we believe that New Testament authorizes, uh, that the New Testament does not authorize mechanical instruments of music and worship? It's not because I don't have any money for it. It's not because I'm not talent, or not talented or have any abilities in regards to it. It's not because I don't like it. It's not because a cappella music sounds better. It's not that, oh, I don't like instrumental music. No, that's not what it's all it's not what, what it's about. What's the reason? It's the authority principle and that we can are to do everything that God says in the way that God said to do it under the new covenant. And so Ephesians five, eighteen and nineteen says, Do not be drunk with wine in which is dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord, giving thanks always for all, all things to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting to one another in the fear of God. I want you to notice the main verbs in this context. The main verbs is do not be drunk, but be filled with the Spirit. Now, I don't want to, I don't have time to get all into what it, what filled with the Spirit meant in that context. But a good parallel passage is indeed, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, in which during this time, you remember how we talked about the temporary and the permanent? During this time, they had prophets and apostles who had the, the miraculous gifts of the Spirit. So they were to be filled with the Spirit and to be used by the Holy Spirit. But today, you and I, we learn and obey the word of God. 
and we're we we uh we let god dwell in our lives we let him reign in our lives so in a sense that's what could be mentioned here and how are we to carry that out by speaking to one another by singing and making melody by giving thanks by submitting to one another and i want you to notice that it's actually plural these are plural uh is what these are said so out of these five principles you know which one of them has been the most controversial well Sadly, it's the making of melody, the salantis, right? But what does solo mean? Well, there's four options that, we're, that we, we know about. Either it's play, like play an instrument, or sing, sing or play, or sing and play. So I want you to think about that most denominations, I would say, probably would go for either number three or number four. Now, some do 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 one, uh, but mostly number three and number four. Now, what do we, what does the Bible teach? To sing is what the Bible teaches, as, we, as, we, as we'll see. And whatever these verses teach, does it involve one, a few, or everyone? Well, obviously it involves everyone, right? Because it's plural. It involves all of us. Now, Think about, let's think about if it's only play only. Well, that means that since it's, it's an imperative to be filled with the Spirit, then that means that everyone would have to play uh, a musical instrument. And that also that no one sings and no one is allowed to sing. So that creates actually an inconsistency because we're to speak. Where to sing. Okay? So that's not, it cannot mean that one. So that would be false. What about play and sing? Well, that means that everyone must sing and play a musical instrument. And this is one of the things that I talk about, that everyone would have to play a musical instrument. Because we're all priests, and we know in the Old Testament, the Levi- the, it was the Levites who, who were the ones who did the instrument, musical instruments. Anyways, but we see that this applies to all. So everyone plays an instrument, must sing. Everyone must play an instrument and sing. No one just plays only. No one sings only. No one's allowed to play only. No one's allowed to sing only. But that, once again, is an inconsistency with the meaning of the word laleo, speaking. Inconsistency with the meaning of the word ado, which is singing. If it means play and sing, the term, what does the term laleo mean? You know, if it means play and sing, the term I don't means what? Play and sing makes a law God did not make. What about sing or play? Well, that allows everyone the choice of singing or playing. So if that, since it applies to all under consideration, it's compulsory for all under consideration. Everyone plays an instrument or sings. Everyone must play an instrument or sing. Some play only, some sing only. And a choice of playing or singing is allowed. But once again... It's an inconsistency with the meaning of the laleo or speaking. It's an inconsistency with the meaning of the word ado, singing. Because if it means play or sing, those who play do not have to speak or, or laleo. But laleo is imperative. If it means play or sing, those who play do not have to ado. But ado is imperative. So play or sing allows the choice of two distinct actions. Play or sing allows a go- choice God did not give. So... That makes that one false. But if it's sing, then it demands that everyone sings. It applies to all. It's compulsory for all because it's an imperative. Everyone sings. Everyone makes melody. Everyone must sing and make melody. None play only. All sing only. None play and sing. And the choice of play is um, play and sing is not allowed. And what's interesting is this is a consistency with the meaning of laleo, because we are all singing. Consistency with the meaning of ado, because we are all singing. Consistency of meaning across the New Testament, and that we are emphasizing the heart is the instrument. Singing and making melody in your heart. Pluck, pluck the strings of your heart to the Lord. We're focusing on the spiritual component of worship. We're focusing on much worshiping God in spirit, and in truth. 
So my argument for against instrumental music would be all actions of worship that are not authorized by the New Testament are actions that are sinful. And there are more passages than this, but these are just some of the ones that I would use. Mechanical instruments of music is an action of worship that's not authorized by the New Testament, either by direct statement, by implication, by expediency, by an account of action. There's none of that. Therefore, mechanical instruments of music is an action that is sinful. You know, Hebrews 2 verse 12 is actually identifying Jesus as the Messiah who have fulfilled David's prophecy and provides salvation for the brotherhood of mankind by taking on a human body. James 5 13 seems to be indicating that when you are by yourself, when you're alone, and, you know, sometimes this has happened to me. Um, I'll be out walking on the track at night, and I love to sing praises to God at that time. So Christians, we have a reason to sing. Rejoice the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. A Christian can sing of God's gracious goodness when our hearts cheerfully overflow with thanksgiving. Now, I know that some people want to say, well, it's, Aren't instruments in Revelation? Well, Revelation includes many symbols which are not to be taken literally. In fact, it says it's signified, Revelation 1.1. The seven stars equals seven angels or seven messengers, Revelation 1.20. Seven lampstands equals the seven churches. The mention of harps does not mean they were used in Christian worship. In fact, the religious symbols are not represent, representative of New Testament worship, but are representative of uh, or sorry, re- reflections of Old Testament worship. You got the golden lampstand, sea of glass, an altar, golden censer, incense, ark of the covenant, tabernacle or temple. Are we? If somebody says, well, we if we can add instruments, then what about adding a physical temple? What about adding the incense? What about adding the golden censer and the physical altar? Are we going to bring that? See, the harps were said to have been held, but not said to have been played. Revelation fifteen verse two. And the sound that John heard was like harpers playing on their harps. And the trumpets that are mentioned are used to describe the sounds John heard to announce the coming events. I thought John Price did a good job of explaining this. He says this argument must be rejected for several reasons. First, Revelation's description of the worship of heaven with its harps also has a temple with golden bows full of incense, golden altar, which was before the throne, 24 elders clothed in white garments and golden crowns on their heads, the same argument that would bring the harps to the church must also bring all these other aspects of worship as well. The Apostle John is speaking figuratively of heaven's work under the image of the Old Testament temple. And what's interesting to me is, okay, are you going to bring the harp into church? Because I've never seen anybody bring a harp. It's always a piano. It's always a guitar or some other instrument. Um, it's kind of interesting, just a side note here. I remember Emily and I, when we were studying with some Jehovah Witnesses, and we were discussing this issue of instrumental music. And um, I remember talking to them about, you know, how there's some of these uh, denominations that in their worship, they'll have these rock bands kind of, and they'll have all this noise and drums and stuff like that. And uh, I remember them saying to me, <laughs> and I kid you not, this is exactly what they said. They said, well, the piano is a more holy instrument. I want you to think about that, a more holy instrument. Well, who's to say? Who, who's to say that, you know? And then John Price says, second, the book of Revelation is filled with figurative language. We would not understand the harps to be literal instruments any more than we would understand that there are literal bows of the wrath of God or a gold cup full of abominations and many other such things. And then there's the interesting part about the history of instrumental music. Isn't it interesting that the early church did not have instrumental music for many, many centuries? And it's interesting that I want to read some of these quotes here. One circumstance in early Christian worship was of vast importance to later musical development. The congregation took part in the musical part of the service. But in most of the older religions, such as the Hebrew and Egyptian, the congregation was passive during service, and the musical as well as the other parts uh, the liturgy were performed by the priesthood. This was not the case in the early Christian church. And then um, this is from Sing His Praises, actually written by Rubel Shelley. And he was quoting some of these people here. He says, in the early Christian church, there was, however, a strong feeling against the use of instruments in divine worship. Some have thought to account for this by the secrecy while the, 
which the Christians had to adopt for their gatherings for worship on account of the persecution to which they were exposed. But if that had been the reason, we would ha- it would have silenced the voice of song as well. In spite of the persecution which made the infant church hide his hide her head mig- mid ignominy, death and tombs, vocal music seems to have been a regular part of the ritual. The development of Western music was decisively influenced by the exclusion of musical instruments from the early Christian church. The early Christians refused to have, let me make that a little bit bigger so you can see it. The early Christians refused to have anything to do with the instrumental music which they might have inherited from their from the ancient world. By living their musical tradition, which much later was to be the matrix out of which modern music grew, to choral music, the unconscious, unconsciously made more difficult the process by which an independent, self-sufficient musical art could develop. In other words, music was destined to be bound to language for a good many centuries. Only singing, however, and no playing of instruments was permitted in the early Christian church. The primitive Christian community held the same view as we know from apostolic and post-apostolic literature. Instrumental music was thought unfit for religious services. The Christian sources are quite outspoken in their condemnation of instrumental performances. Originally, only song was considered worthy of direct approach to the divinity. All ancient mu- Christian music was vocal. We need one instrument, the peaceful word of adoration, not harps or drums or pipes or trumpets, said Clement of Alexandria around 200 A.D. There is no evidence for the use of musical instruments, and if we picture the believers as men and women drawn from the poor strata of society and meeting clandestinely, the non-mention of instrumental music is not surprising. The making melody in the is in the heart. A particular interest is an article in the Catholic Encyclopedia, which states for almost a thousand years, Gregorian chant without any instrumental or harmonic addition was the only music used in connection with the liturgy. Uh, later, Pius X, in his Motu Propri- Proprio on church music, in paragraph 4, says, Although the music proper to the church is purely vocal music, music with the company of the organ is also permitted, as the chant should always have the first place. The organ or instruments should merely sustain and never suppress it, and it is recognized and in many places acted upon that the new version of the litur- liturgical chant proposed to the Catholic world by Pius X gains its full beauty and effectiveness only when sung without instrumental music, without instrumental accompaniment of any kind. And then we can read, uh, this is from uh, the book, uh, The Music Question by Foy Wallace. The American Encyclopedia Pope Vitalian is related to have first introduced organs into some of the churches of Western Europe about 670, but the earliest trustworthy account is that of the one sent as a present by the Greek Emperor Constantine Copernicus Copernicus to Pepin, King of the Franks, in 755. And then Chambers Encyclopedia, the organ is said to have been first introduced into church music by Pope Vitalian I in 666. Hmm, interesting. <laughs> no, just joking. Uh, in 757, a great organ was sent as a present to Pepin by the Byzantine Emperor Constantine Copernicus Copremius and place in the church of St. Cornell at Copiane soon after Charlemagne's time organs became common. In Cyclopaedia Britannica, though the church from the time to time appropriated the secular art forms from their rise to their maturity, its chief authorities were always jealous of these advances and issued edicts against them. So in 1322, Pope John XXII denounced the encroachments of counterpoint, alleging that the volt vol- Voluptuous harmony of of uh, three Ds and six was fit, but for profane uses. And then in, in the Greek church, the organ never came into use, but after the 8th century, it became more and more common in the Latin church, not, ha- not however, without opposition from the side of the monks. The Reformed church discarded it, and though the church of Basil very early introduced it, it was in other places admittedly only sparingly and after a long hesitation. This spe- uh, vocal music, this species, which is the most natural, may be considered to have existed before any other. It was continued by the Jews and is the only kind that's permitted in the Greek and Scotch churches with or with few exceptions in dissenting congregations in England. 
The Christian rule requires its use both for personal and social edification, Ephesians 5, Colossians 3, the vocal music of the imperial cor choristers in St. Petersburg in incomparably surpasses in sweetness and effect the sounds produced by the combined power of the most exquisite musical instruments. Instrumental music is also a very ancient date. Its invention being subscribed to Tubal, sixth descendant from Cain, that instrumental music was not practiced by the primitive Christians, but was an aid to devotion of later times as evident from church history. London Encyclopedia, Pope Vitalianus in 658 introduced the organ into the Roman churches to accompany the singers. Leo II in 682 reformed the singing of the psalms and hymns, accommodating the intonation of them to the manner in which they are sung or performed at the present day. The unanimity in which, with which the learned authorities of this class testify that there being but slight variation as to exact dates is worthy of note, but others equally noted in their spheres shall speak. And then Joseph Bingham, the well-known author of Antiquities of the Christian Church, said, or said, said to be one of the most learned men of the Church of England ever produced, says, Music in churches is as ancient as the apostles, but instrumental music not so. And then John Godot says, The Church, although lapsing more and more into def defection from the truth and into a corruption of apostolic practice, had no instrumental music for 1,200 years. That is, is not in general use before this time. The Calvinistic Reformed Church ejected, ejected it from its services as an element of popery, even the Church of England, having come very nigh to its extrusion from her worship, is heresy in the sphere of worship. So as you can see, church I know that church history is not, um, so to speak, um, we are our source of authority is the word of God. That's what we abide by. But I think it's interesting how this supports what we've been saying. And it's kind of a corroborative piece of evidence, you could say. I think John Price said it very well. The regulations of God's worship according to his word is one of the greatest tasks of the Christian church. It is a matter of the highest importance. Great care must be taken all we do in worship. For man to bring his own inventions into the church is false worship and idolatry. Dangers abound and eternal consequences lie before us if mistakes are made in this area of the church's life. False worship brings God's judgment, referring to Nadab and Abihu. And the apostles warn us that idolaters shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Now, what I want to do is we're going to listen to Brother William Woodson. And I thought he did a fine job of, exp of giving a great story that's been talking about what we've been saying. And this is Brother Floyd Decker, and uh, I just want you to see he was once a part of the Christian church. Um, but let's listen to what uh, Brother Woodson says, and then we'll, I think, end there. To offer mechanical, instrumental music in its worship. Now let me illustrate that by an account that I heard the late brother Floyd Decker present. Floyd Decker was an unusual man in so many ways. I knew him in Tupelo, Mississippi in uh, 1957, 58, and 59. Brother Decker was holding a meeting a little bit north of Tupelo at that time in a little town called Guntown. I don't know where they got that name, but anyway, that was. Him and I have actually passed through that quite a bit. The name of the little town, and he was there in a tent meeting. And one night he preached on instrumental music, and he told this story. Years later, in Bandana, Kentucky, I narrated the summary of the same event. And there were people in Bandana, just a few miles from Paducah, who were present when the event I'm about to describe occurred. And they said, we were there, and that's exactly the way it was. Well, I didn't doubt it when Decker told it. But it was interesting to me that it was confirmed by folks even uh, years later and after his death. Well, here's the story. Decker said when uh, he was living in uh, Paducah, Kentucky, we're talking 1926-27 now, 
that he was the preacher for the Merle Boulevard Christian Church. And in that Christian church, there was a fine woman who was neighbors and friends with a woman who was a member of the Church of Christ where T.C. Wilcox preached. And as neighbors sometimes do, they talked about many things and finally began talking about church. And they finally got around to talking about different subjects. And from time to time, when one or the other had asked a question the other couldn't answer, the person would go to one of the preachers and talk about it, and they'd talk back and forth. Well, finally, they got around instrumental music. And Brother Decker said that uh, questions would come up, and the lady from the Church of Christ would ask the woman in the Christian church a question. She'd come over to Decker and go back and back and forth and back and forth. And finally, he said, I got tired of that. And so he said, I told her, why don't you tell that lady that she needs to talk to her preacher, and that preacher needs to be willing to uphold what he believes. He doesn't believe you ought to use instrumental music. We do. And if he has any convictions and courage about him, then he'll agree to discuss this matter with me. Well, she carried the information over there. And T.C. Wilcox said, fine, when do you want to start? How long do you want to talk about it? Well, they negotiated a six-night discussion. Six nights. And Brother Decker was the first speaker. And he said he got up and he quoted Old Testament verses and he did this and that and on and on, 30 minutes. And then he said, Wilcox got up and he said the following. Went to one side of the board and wrote the word sing on it. Went to the other side of the board and wrote the word play on it. Now he said the Bible says, and he quoted the passage, Ephesians 5, 19, Colossians 3, etc. And he said that's what we do. We sing. The Bible teaches the church to sing. That's what we do. Now he said, that's what you do, Brother Decker. And then drew a circle and he said, now write the verse in the New Testament that teaches the church to play an instrument in the worship of God. Sat down, two minutes. Well, Brother Decker said, I got up and I told him how silly he was and how awful it was and embarrassing it was and how he had failed miserably and on and on and on. But he said, I never did pick up the chalk. Well, when the 30 minutes was up, Wilcox got right back up and he said, well, he must not have understood. Decker said, I did understand, but I didn't want them to know that. So he went right back over it. Here's the word sing. Here's the word play. This is what we do. This is what y'all do. Here are the verses. Where's your verse? Sat down again. Well, the audience was dismissed. Now, I don't know whether they do it out here in uh, California or not. But when elders do this way with preachers, it's not fun. <laughs> well, Decker said that's what they did. Carried him down the basement. And the elders of the Christian church said, Brother Decker, we're very disappointed in you. Very embarrassed about this. And he said, what do you mean? Well, they said, he, he wanted you to put that verse up there and you didn't do it. And he said, well, I'd be glad to if you'd tell me where it is. <laughs> and they said, there's not one? He said, there's not one. And they said, what are you going to do? And he said, I don't know, but I've got five more nights of this. <laughs> Well, Decker said he went through that same thing Monday night, on Tuesday night, on Wednesday night. And he said, bless his heart, old Wilcox had one thing to say, and before he got through, even a child could have made the argument. And Decker said, along about Thursday night, it began to dawn on me. 
it began to dawn on me what's happening here. We're not just carrying on an exchange of ideas. We're not trying to best one another. What is really happening is this man is probing my heart and he is obliging me to admit, if not in actual words, that I cannot justify by the word of God what I'm doing in worship. I can't do that. And I know that, and he knows that, and everybody there knows it. And then he said, this is not a struggle with T.C. Wilcox. This is a struggle between me and God. And Decker said, I knew then I never could get over this problem. And he said, I tried every way I could to be cute the rest of the debate. But deep down inside, he couldn't get the point out of his mind. The debate ended. Time went on. And then he said, I approached the elders of that Christian church. And I said, brethren, I can't go on like this. I can't keep preaching like I've been doing. And they said, what do you mean? He said, I know now that instrumental music is not right. And they said, you'll never preach here again. You're out of here. And Brother Decker went down to the building where Wilcox was the preacher. And he said, I'm sorry. I've been wrong. And I want to spend the rest of my life serving God as he has taught me to do. Well, I heard that from Brother Decker. And I thought that is a wonderful thing to think about. And I believe that capsule in that little story is this whole matter. Deep down inside, the matter of the use or non-use of instrumental music has to do with the principle of whether one is willing to abide by the teaching of God or not in worship. As was done so many years ago, the church can find easily passages that teach us to sing in the worship of God. But there's not a person alive that can find a text in the scripture that teaches the church today to use instrumental music in the worship. I'm well aware of the argumentation that's been given to attempt that. But when it has all been heard, the text is still not available. And then we come back to this point. Will we follow what God has taught us to do or will we not? And once the decision is made to follow that which God has not taught us to do, we have left God behind at that moment. We have taken the first step that leads ultimately away from God. And there's no stopping it. We may not go as far as somebody else will. But that first step is a long and significant one because it is said with reference to God, I'm not going to do what you told me to do in the way you've taught me to do it. I will elevate my wishes and thoughts and desires to the level of your divine authority. And I will say, your authority does not matter enough to me to bring my wishes and thoughts under your revealed will. My Good story, ain't that? I hope you can see, friends, what we've been trying to get at in regards to these. this lesson. I know it's been long. Um, I hope you can see that we know the truth. We can know the truth. 
that we can know that God in heaven has given us the new covenant. He's told us how to worship him, to bring glory and honor to him. And if we would have the faith to submit to his will and to bring glory and honor to his name and his name alone. Let us be people who are not like Jeroboam, not like Cain, not like all those other ones, but be people who truly love God, who want to serve him with every ounce of our being. Really thank you for being with me today, and I hope that if if you come across this and you realize that you're a part of a religious group that does use instrumental music, I hope you'll do the right thing by repenting of that, getting, uh, of course, out of that denomination, but I want you to obey the truth of the gospel that is as taught in the scriptures. And we've certainly gone on that in our other lessons. I really appreciate you being with us, and I hope that you have a good night. Thank you so much.